We know that when we observe galaxies and quasars, in general their wavelength appears to be shifted towards the red end of the spectrum, compared to the laboratory values. Now I've previously discussed many times the link that is then made with the redshift and its distance. We see this shift in the laboratory and we can to some extent see part of this shift in binary stars that orbit, but no one has been able to measure both actual distances and the redshift to anything beyond our local neighbourhood. This means our understanding of distance could be wrong by a factor of 10 to 100 and the luminosities and masses by as much as 10,000. Halton Arp spent the majority of his life trying to convince others that there was a fundamental misunderstanding of redshift. In this series I would like to explore some of the evidence that Halton collected so that you can see this connection yourself. In this episode we will examine the data ARP collected showing the connection between an active galaxy and quasars, and show that these do not appear to be randomly distributed, but there appears to be a clear pattern in the data that ARP collected. When telescopes were first being developed, and systematic spectroscopic observations started, it was natural to observe as much as possible. And this meant bright stars, and one of the things that could be measured accurately was the line shift in stellar spectra. As the data accumulated, it was noticed that the bright blue stars had lines which were slightly but significantly shifted to the red. In 1911, W. Campbell gave the enigmatic name K effect to this phenomena. Since all the other stars in our galaxy move together in a reasonable way, it was not concluded that we live at the centre of an expanding shell of observed blue stars. The effect was unexplained until the 1930s, when Robert Trumpler again found the effect in clusters of young stars in our galaxy. He thought he could explain it with a gravitational redshift at the surface of these hot, most luminous stars but that failed when the surface gravity turned out to be too weak. Max Born and Erwin Finley Freudlich tried to explain it with tired light, but this did not catch on either, so the observations were again buried and forgotten. Now I've spent over 30 years cataloguing some of these anomalies, and many times being refused telescope time to observe the objects in more detail. Many others also became interested and started to look at these objects as well. So let's examine some of the best evidence related to X-ray observations. NGC 4258 When this galaxy was observed in X-ray, there were two conspicuous X-ray sources paired across the nucleus of the galaxy. When this was overlaid with an optical image, these X-ray sources matched with the two blue stellar objects. ARP suspected that these blue stellar objects would turn out to be quasars but was refused any time to obtain the required optical spectra to confirm his hunch. Two years later, Margaret Burbage was able to capture the required image, and these confirmed ARP's hunch. These were two quasars. When it was confirmed that these were indeed quasars, their redshifts became available. Both of these had remarkably similar redshift. The chances of this are unusual. Add in the fact that they are so close, and that they sit opposite the galaxy and are aligned with the axis and it becomes harder and harder to ignore. One important point to note is that NGC 4258 is one of the most active nearby spiral galaxies known. Margaret Burbage was then blocked from submitting her results and forced to publish in a European paper with a referee stating it was just another isolated case. Now this galaxy is so active that it has glowing plasma arms emerging from the centre of the nucleus. These protospiral arms were also a source of synchrotron radiation. It also contained water mesa spots, and these are excited water molecules in the central part near the nucleus. And these had a redshift deviation of plus and minus a thousand kilometres per second from the redshift of the nucleus. They also seem to be positioned along the same axis as the quasars were aligned. These are believed to have been ejected from the core some 18 million years ago, according to the accepted theory. And when we overlay the deviations of the pair of quasars with a central galaxy, you will see the pattern. 
both show the same relative difference but one positive and one negative. The speed is greater with the water mesa and lower at the quasar. And again, the chances of all of these things occurring together are 1 in 2.5 million. PG1211 plus 143. Now this contains a bright quasar that appears to have a line of radio sources passing through it. And one of the radio sources is a higher redshift quasar. The central object is once more an active galaxy. So here we have a pair of quasars that are aligned with a radio source that are accepted to be ejected from the active galaxy. The redshift of both of these objects was again very similar. IC1767. Here we find two radio quasars located near IC1767. Both these have a redshift of 0.67 and 0.62. And as a reminder, these types of quasars can vary from a redshift of 0.1 to 2.4. So the chances of finding two quasars so close in redshift and then across from each other with a galaxy bang in the middle? NGC 4319 and Markarian 205. Probably the most famous connection and the most controversial one ARP has looked at. Here ARP showed in an image from 1971 that there was a clear connection in the image between these two objects. Here we have a central galaxy with a quasar situated just below it. More interesting is when they examined the area between NGC 4319 and Markarian 205 in X-ray, it showed up two X-ray filaments coming out either side of Markarian 205 and ending on point-like X-ray sources. When these points are seen in optical, it reveals two bright blue stellar objects. And these have redshifts of 0.67 and 0.46 and are seemingly linked by this X-ray filament. NGC 4651 and 3C275.1 now the bright radio quasar 3C275.1 is situated only 3.5 arc minutes from the bright apparent magnitude spiral galaxy NGC 4651. Add into this the fact that this galaxy has jets emerging from it. On initial inspection, you would say that the jets do not appear to point at the quasar, so these could not be related. However, when a deep plate is examined, you can see that the material is filling in under the jets, down to within a direction of only 6 degrees away in position angle from the quasar. You can also see that there is material extending away from the quasar back towards this jet. Another remarkable part of this image is something that we often see in these configurations. Lines of sources emanating from them, and that these lines are nearly at right angles to each other. Markarian 474 and NGC 5689. This group is dominated by a central Seyfert galaxy. Right next to this we find an ultraviolet rich galaxy called Markarian 474. The central galaxy appeared to have a redshift of 100 km per second compared to Markarian 474 which had a redshift of 10,000 km per second. Markarian 474 was a highly active Seyfert galaxy. X-ray images show that the X-ray emanating material is being ejected along the minor axis of the parent galaxy in the system NGC 5689. There also appears to be another X-ray source located in an X pattern across from Markarian 474. Most of these are associated with blue stellar objects and may represent additional quasars associated with this active group. NGC 3067 and 3C232. Now this is a very active starburst galaxy with an associated quasar situated above it. A filament of hydrogen can be seen extending from this galaxy to the quasar and beyond. The quasar also seems to be located at the dentist part of this filament. Now arguments have been made that the filament which sits at the same redshift of the galaxy actually absorbed continuum light from the quasar, but it doesn't show any excited optical emission lines, and that this therefore proves that the quasar must be much further back. But it is important to realise that in order for them to come to that conclusion, 
they have to do a short extrapolation. This is because the photons that they need to ionize the hydrogen in the filament and make it fluoresce are at a shorter wavelength than those in the spectrum. So they have to extrapolate to an unobserved portion of the spectrum. And the short story is that they can only do this if they know the amount of hydrogen that there is at that redshift, the degree to which the filament was composed of small dense clouds, and the relative beam angles between the ultraviolet and the radio wavelength of the quasar. In other words, they don't know any of this. So again, you, the argument to say that it isn't at that point is not strong enough in my mind. So again, looking purely at the observational data, we can't rule out that it is, but we also cannot rule out that it isn't because the extrapolation requires too many ifs and buts in order for them to come to that conclusion and rule it out altogether. Now, further X-ray imaging of the quasar also revealed another X-shaped pattern surrounding the quasar itself. NGC 5832 and 3C309.1. Now, when examining the X-ray image of the quasar, we once more see a very clear line of strong sources running northeast to southwest right through the quasar. And there is also possibly the suggestion of a line perpendicular to this. Now, other examples, and, and there are many, again, if you are interested in looking at this, there is a whole catalog that are produced that I'll link down below in the description that you can scroll through. But other examples that show this clear relationship between where the quasar sits and the host galaxy that creates these sort of X-shaped patterns. So very briefly, NGC 4235, NGC 3516, NGC 5985, NGC 2639, NGC 3628, N7817, N623, and N720. And this is really just the tip of the iceberg. The important point to take from this initial video is that there is a clear link with safer galaxies having jets which eject material across either of the major or minor axes. And this material clearly moves away and many show both X-ray and radio sources along these filaments. This is accepted. This is accepted in mainstream. We also see quasars along the same axis and some even showing an association with the ejected material or filament. Now it can be argued that these quasars are actually located behind the filaments and that this is mere coincidence. As I've discussed when we looked at NGC 3067 and 3C232, the way that they calculate this requires them to extrapolate, which can equally be argued adds in a fudge factor where they have to make assumptions about how much hydrogen there is in the filament, how clumpy it is, and the beam angle itself. And all of which they don't know. I would also argue that the amount of correlations ARP found cannot be ignored. For now, it is not important to look at ARP's theory, but just the data. We see ejected materials from active galaxies. This material tends to clump, and we often find quasars along these paths. We have also seen examples where this same process occurs with quasars itself, producing filaments, which then produce new radio and X-ray sources. In future episodes, I want to explore more of ARP's data and examine the wider field images that show this clustering and X shape across older and newer galaxies. I would also like to examine the second important part of ARP's work, and that is the quantization of the redshift itself, which together with what we have seen here, makes it harder and harder to ignore this evidence. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.